And he was a great big burly guy, and I knew the only way I was going to fight him was make sure somebody's behind me. And I told Hal, and he said, ah, just have a good time. You know, don't worry about it. Ain't nothing going to happen. The place is packed. He said something, and then I threw down a, a drink on the bar, and I had this, uh, you know, lift where you go behind the bar. And I hit him, and he was stuck in that <laughs> corner. <laughs> the only way I was going to win was if he stayed stuck. And, and now Hal and everybody's holding me back, and he's getting out. And of course, he come toward me like a bull. <laughs> My name is Rob Word, and I am here to join everyone in the room to celebrate the great stuntman, Hal Needham. Yeah, yeah. This is a special month for us because we have a room filled with stuntmen. And I'm going to bring up one of Hal's close friends, Billy Burton. Sound good? Good, good. <laughs> the first time I met Hal Needham, I was a little skinny extra at Universal on uh, Bo Jest. And I run to this guy, and his pants were a little short, and he had his boots on, he had his jeans, he had his Levi shirt, sleeves rolled up, and he was there holding court. Paterni was there, Buddy Joe Hooker, everybody. And it was, I was like amazed at this man's presence. I couldn't believe this guy was bigger than life itself. And I don't want to get emotional. Emotional. I look at this poster, The Greatest Stuntman Alive, that was Needham. He was a legend, a true legend. He didn't become a legend from talking about it. He was a legend from doing it. He did it all. He did it well. They tried to keep him out of the movie business, and it didn't work. And he took it over. And he made, brought in all the young guys. Before that, the young guy couldn't get a break. He brought in women, blacks. He did more for people in this business and more for the business. He brought notoriety to the stuntmen, stunt coordinators, second unit directors, directors. He was, he was the leader of it all. And uh, I won't bloviate anymore. <laughs> well, you did Bo Jess with, uh, I think Doug was in that, Doug McClure, Guy Stockwell. What did you do in that film? Uh, I didn't even have a guild card. I was an extra working on a waiver. <laughs> went down, my brother got me the job went down to Yuma, Arizona first time I ever flew in an airplane we all got in the bus went to wardrobe first at Universal got in the bus went over to Burbank Airport got on a DC-3 chugged down there to Yuma landed got off got on the bus went right out there got on our horses and went to throwing pots over the wall and all dressed as Arabs and makeup on the base pay was $35, and the end of the day, they somebody went up and negotiated with the assistant director, and he came back, he says, how's 300 for the day? <laughs> I went, 300? My God. <laughs> that was Jack, Lily, and Rod Maga. Next day, another 250 I thought, I'm here, guys. I went home. I didn't even get a check. I borrowed the money from my brother and went down and paid my dues. I was, that was it. It was all over for me. Ruined me. <laughs> and it's been a great ride and Needham what a great mentor uh, I, you know like I say he did so much he mentored so many of us young guys McClarty Gibbs Bullock myself Royden Clark he didn't mentor him Royden was a little older but he darn sure <laughs> you know there's so many guys Gilbert and, and uh, you know Stanley Barrett and he and Ronnie Rondell were, you know it was just uh, he was a great role model, great human being. I miss him dearly. He seemed to have a real knack for marketing, for, for making what he was doing and what he had his guys doing get some notoriety. Like you said, it, it put everybody up on another level. One day, just for the heck of it, he decided he was going to try to do five different TV episodes in one day. And so he started at 6 a.m., and he, he did a Virginian, he did a Bonanza, he did all these different shows, and he, he ended at three in the morning doing a gag, and he had to wait for hours to do that one. And he thought, I could have squeezed in one more show. <laughs> 
But then he discovered talking to the stunt guys who were working on the Alamo that they made more money waiting than he did during those five shows. So he said, I'm doing features from now on. <laughs> Yeah, he, he did a lot of things for a lot of people, and I look right here at Laura Lizer. He discovered her. I thought I discovered her. Yeah. <laughs> it's my lovely wife, Laura, that I didn't introduce, so yes. there she is. And I, I don't want to embarrass her, but she was Hal's business manager uh, prior to him directing Smokey and the Bandit. So Yeah, we all, we all joined up with Laura early on. There was like 10... 20 of us, all stunt guys, all stunts unlimited. And she was a little mother hen that took care of us. We went in there once a month, or if we had needed something, go see Laura. <laughs> in terms of, you know, how breaking bones and, and doing dangerous stunts, what is the, the hairiest adventure that you had with Hal? Um, going to his ex-wife's house to... <laughs> <laughs> to try to make amends for Needham. <laughs> He was living with me at the time, and I went over and saw Arlene, and we, we had coffee at the table for about four hours. And when I left there, as I walked out the door, I went, damn, I wouldn't let him back either. <laughs> <laughs> but Needham, gosh, I, I, I can't even go on about the things that he did. And, and uh, he, he never shirked one. I mean, he was, he, was the, he was the most macho but unassuming stunt guy that I knew. The greatest stuntman alive. I mean, he, he didn't back up from nothing. There was no backup of that man. He did it all. And if you couldn't do it, look out. He's getting in your clothes, and he'll do it. And better. So you better do your job well when you need him. Because if you, if you didn't, he's in the clothes. He hired everybody his size. <laughs> <laughs> I, I broke my leg skiing one time, and he came to visit. I'm laid up in bed, and, and how, right away he's going, what meds are you on? <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, you know, I'm lying there, and I'm in pain, my legs up and everything. I go, uh, they, they've given me Hergadan. And he goes, no, no, no. He reaches into his pocket, <laughs> pulls out a handful, and he says, this is what you need. <laughs> And he, he blows the lint off and, and then pours them in my hand. And he was right. The pain went away. <laughs> All units, got a man heading up to Jackson Road. Cut him out. Finished American Graffiti. My next picture was with uh, Bert and uh, White Lightning, and I, I, uh, I used to come down on the weekends when I wasn't filming in Frisco. I went to Bert's house the first time, and he came to the door, and Hal was staying with him at that time. When I met Bert at the door, Bert was about here to me, and uh, next week I come down. Bert's like this to me. <laughs> I don't know. At first, I thought it was one of, maybe it's because I was drinking. <laughs> but I came down the uh, the following week, and Hal met me at the door, and I, I said, "Is it me or uh, Bert shorter?" One time I see him, and he's taller than me. The next time I see him, he said he wears lifts. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> So, uh, when we started uh, White Lightning, um, I, I went down, I had to fly from, from to Little Rock, and uh, they had this place called One-Eyed Jacks where all the guys went, and Hal and me and a bunch of us went over, you know, for a drink. And the owner had seen Culpepper, and he was just in love with Hal, you know, for being the coordinator. I guess you can learn a lot on a cattle drive, if you live that long. <laughs> so 
So we got free drinks uh, uh, every time we went in, and apparently this one guy didn't like it. And so I uh, actually was dating one of the waitresses back in my younger days. <laughs> and uh, we're standing there, and Hal's dancing, and this guy kept saying, you know, smart remarks to me. And by that time, I'd had enough who hit John to respond. And he was a great big burly guy, and I knew the only way I was going to fight him was make sure somebody's behind me. And I told Hal, and he said, ah, just have a good time. You know, don't worry about it. Ain't nothing going to happen. The place is packed. So next time they brought me a free drink, he said something, and then I threw down a, a drink on the bar, and I had this, uh, you know, lift where you go behind the bar. And I hit him, and he was stuck in that corner. <laughs> By the time I got ready to, the only way I was going to win was if he stayed stuck. And, and now Hal and everybody's holding me back, and he's getting out, and of he come toward me like a bull. <laughs> anyway, they broke it up. The owner said, um, you know, he wasn't supposed to be in here. He shot at uh, the cops, and he's cut about four teenagers. And um, so we, we kicked him out. Well, naturally, I couldn't have got a nerd. I had to get a killer, so we go to walk outside. <laughs> and, uh, and on the way out the door, uh, to this day, uh, I'll never understand it, except for the fact that, you know, somebody up there likes me. Um, Hal was beside me, and the... the uh, wardrobe guy was over here and then I was here and at the last minute I heard this uh, hey man what was on I threw up my arm because it was behind me and he caught me with a hawk bill would have got me here if I hadn't threw up my arm down through here I would show you the scar but I hadn't lost enough weight to take off my shirt <laughs> so so I was cut pretty bad, and, and hell, it, it, we, the next day is my first day of shooting. Now I'm bleeding like a stuck pig, and as I chase this guy down the street, um, Hal's right beside me, had on a brand new Hawaiian shirt, ripped that uh, sleeve off, tied me a tourniquet. Then I figure, well, goddamn, I am hurt if Hal tied tears that shirt up like that and I know I'm stuck <laughs> and they called the ambulance and I had to go straight to the hospital and this lady doctor sewed me up and I will forget her, she was just great thank God I was drunk and um, and Hal stayed up with me when we got back to the hotel uh, all night the rest of the night I was on pills uh, he made sure he changed my dressing and um and, and the next day, I was at work, um, and Bert is climbing all over me. You got a career, blah, 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 blah. Now, the end of this story is that I, I, I told Hal and I'll be able to, you know, repay you for, you probably saved my life, because I would eventually run out of blood. <laughs> <laughs> two things in the world I'm scared of. What's that? Women and the police. It's hard not to be emotional when you talk about him. Uh, the first time I met Al, uh, I wasn't even in uh, the guild. I was working as a wrangler. Uh, there was a doing a racehorse picture at, uh, I think it was Santa Anita or Hollywood Park, one or the other, and I was down there walking hot as a, as a wrangler. And uh, they'd brought in a Sent guy to do a horse fall on the track behind a bunch of race horses. Well, anyway, the guy couldn't get it done. And Cliff Lyons was an old time stunt guy and he was directed second unit. And, uh, it was right after they did the Alamo. Anyway, he called, uh, Roberson. Roberson called Hal Needham and Hal showed up with his black horse. And, uh, just so happened I got to take care of the black horse while he was there. So I met Hal. And um, uh, obviously, he made it work. He got it done on the track where the other guy couldn't. And uh, 
uh, he, uh, I don't want I don't know, excuse me. I don't know how I found this out, but uh, he made, made sure the other guy got paid too. He got paid for his money, for the horse fall, and he made sure the other stunt guy got paid also. Those arrangements were paid. He made, uh, made an impression upon me, and uh, later on I got in the guild, and I was working on the Virginian and uh, different shows like that, and I met him and worked with him, and he was always, uh, he was a tough son of a bitch. <laughs> uh, and I, I always tried to pattern my uh, uh, stunt ability and my, uh, my career after him. I never could catch him. He was always too far out ahead of me. But guy with an eighth grade education, he really seemed to know intuitively how to to take care of people, to take care of himself, and to promote it in such a way. I mean, how many stunt guys ever had a doll made yeah. and named after them? Hal did. Uh, <laughs> when he told me that, I laughed. I thought, <laughs> we all laughed. <laughs> yeah. But it worked. Yes, it did. It worked. It did. Yeah. And, and the, the call for Little Big Man, because you were always uh, so good with horses and everything, what was that location like? I know Arthur Penn was a director who had, had just come off of uh, Bonnie and Clyde, hadn't done any westerns before, so he needed somebody like Hal and, and, and stunt guys who knew what they were doing. And he hired the best, uh, and Hal hired the best. And I was lucky enough to be hired to go on there, uh, unlucky enough to, on the, I think it was the eighth day of shooting, I got an arrow in the eye. As right. I understand it, I know Dean Smith worked on that film too. Yes. And he talked about how the, the Native Americans would take the tips off of their arrows just that, to show how macho they were, especially yeah. with you. That's what hit me in the eye, was the, like the blunt end of a dowel pen or a pencil that was before you sharpened it. You know, they, they found out about the third day that if you pull that big rubber tip off the arrow, it'd go twice as far and three times as fast. So they, it was kind of a play thing for them. I mean, Indians have a different way of looking at things. And uh... My dear woman, you have nothing to fear from the Indians. I give you my personal guarantee. They'd ride up to one of their friends and just shoot him right in the ribs with an arrow and they'd, uh, about the... I don't know how many days into the thing. Well, after I got hit, they took all the arrows away from all the st stunt guy uh, from the Indians, and they took all the blanks away from them because when in between scenes they'd ride up and they'd bunch up, and one of them would take a thirty thirty and put it down like this under the his friend's horse next to him and blow it off and watch him get bucked off. You know, they thought that was fun. You know, I was a great sport. So, uh, but after I got hit, they they took all the arrows away from the the Indians and everybody rode through and you couldn't tell if they had arrows or not. They'd just reach back here and do one of these things and you couldn't tell the difference. So, you know, after that, nobody got hit with an arrow. Working with Hal, when he would prepare a film with the gags, how much time would you normally have, uh, dependent probably on, on how difficult the gag was, but was he safety conscious always? To a point. <laughs> Hal was safe, but if you were gonna if you're gonna work for Hal, you better bring your bag and all your pads and everything else. Because, uh, like Burton said, if, if you can't do it, he will. Believe me, he'll jump right in your clothes and uh, uh, make you look like an idiot. You know. So, if you're gonna go work for Hal Needham, two things: don't be late, and you better turn on, because that's what he wants to see. <laughs> Oh, you devil! Oh, oh. Onward! To little big horn! Ah! <laughs> he was the best all around. I mean, there were specialty guys that could do this better than him and that better than him. But if you wanted an all-round guy that could do just about everything in the picture business at that time, he was the guy you wanted. I never seen him do anything halfway. Uh, 
if it was supposed to be fast, it was going to be real fast. If it was supposed to be hard, it was going to be real hard. You know, I mean, uh, he was, like I said before, he's a tough son of a bitch. You know, I, I couldn't keep up with him. I watched a lot of stunt people come and go. I've seen good ones. I've seen bad ones. I've seen all kinds. And in my estimation, it's just my way of looking at things. He was the best all around. I mean, there were specialty guys that could do this better than him and that better than him. But if you wanted an all-around guy that could do just about everything in the picture business at that time, he was the guy you wanted. Uh, very honored that he was my friend, and uh, I really miss him. I'm going to tell uh, one, one little story, maybe two. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, another guy that I miss right now is, uh, <coughs> sorry, Gary McClarty. He was just, he uh, got killed last Saturday, him and Bob Orson both. But he worked more for Hal than anybody else. Hal took him everywhere. Hal came up with the idea to put a, a cannon in a car and uh, explode it going down the road. So... Him and McClarty and a couple, I don't, they was probably f five guys. I wasn't there. This is a second-hand story, but McClarty told me this story so many times that uh, it's embedded in my mind. So they, they get this old Ford that won't even run, and they mount this cannon in the back, behind the front seat in the back. Uh, to this day, we don't know who the, the FX guy was that uh, gave him the powder, but he gave him four, I think there were five-ounce bombs, you know, wrapped up and whatnot. So they go out to, uh, out by Palmdale, out by the Air Force Base out there, and they tow this car out there, and McClarty's got this old brown Ford pickup. And uh, so they get out there, and uh, it was probably five guys, Hal, McClarty, and two or three other guys. So all the brain power that they got wouldn't amount to very much as far as powder together. So they, dis they decide, Hal or somebody says, we better put a bomb in there and see what one of these bombs does. So the car just sitting still, they put a bomb in it, and they set it off, and boom, it does one of those things. Oh, my God, they said, uh, what are we going to do? And they talked a little bit, and finally they said, well, if we put two in it, it's not enough. We only got one bomb left. Let's put them all in there. So they did. <laughs> they put all this powder in this cannon. Well, Unbeknownst to them, you don't just double uh, the powder amount. When you double it, you quadruple it or something. Anyway, so they put all these bombs in there, and Hal t tells McCarty, he says, now you push me with the pickup, and you get me up to whatever it was, 40 miles an hour. They're going out across the, this flat, dry lake. And <laughs> uh, McCarty said he pushed him up, and Hal gave him the sign to wave off. He backed off, and Hal hit the button. <laughs> And he said he had to do this to look out the window to see where he went. <laughs> he went, went plumb out of sight, you know? And he backed off, and the car made, God knows how high it went. Way, way down there in the lid on the trunk, thank God. And all it had was one roll bar in it. And he lit on the trunk, the trunk folded in, and it, it broke his back again, it punctured his lung, it did all these things, and they drove down there and they got him out, and uh, <laughs> he's doing it like this, he can't breathe, so McClarty's blowing in his mouth, so they put Hal in the back of the pickup, and McClarty stayed back there and kept blowing in his mouth, they took him to Palmdale, the hospital, and two or three days later he'd come out, but that's the kind of guy he was. And Hal said he heard them say, is he alive? I think he's dead. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it could have been. It could have been. But uh, oh. he told McClarty, he said, uh, take the cannon out and take it with you and go to Seattle and you do the job, which he did. But he was smart enough that he had an effects guy with him. He didn't put quite so much powder in it. <laughs> <laughs> but he went down the beach and blowed it and turned it over nine or ten times down the beach. <laughs> McHugh. It's nice that all of you are here today to, to talk about the stunts. The, the movies would be nothing without you, uh, without you risking your lives and, and doing a great job. And it's nice that, 
that we're able to get together and to talk about Hal because Hal not only was a great stuntman, as we've heard, he was just a good guy and fun to be with. Told great stories and always was bigger than life, just, yeah. just like the movies. remember the summer of 1866. That was the most important year of my life. That year I got my first real job, and I couldn't wait to break loose. I'm with you, Mr. Culpepper. Why? Because I want to be a cowboy. Well, that's one hell of an ambition, boy. <laughs> yeah! I've never been up north before. Where do we get to the desert? I met a lot of new folks that summer, and it changed my whole way of thinking. That's the old lady. The boys used to say you could get better grub in jail. How do you know what to put in there? I don't. There's Luke, Russ, Missoula, and Dixie Brick. Russ was kind of crazy. Don't stand behind me, kid. The Canyon Gang. <laughs> One thing I learned from them, you can't trust anybody. Sorry. I, I didn't mean nothing. You just cost me a good man, boy. Just drop your gun belts on the floor. Because all I gotta do is spit. Mr. Thornton Pierce. He owned all the land between here and Fort Lewis. Now get your horses and walk them out of town. Skit, boy! And you too, brother! Brother Nathaniel. He didn't fight. Get off my land! But he wouldn't run. God's land. My land! God's land. You're a squatter. Around here we shoot squatters. These people, they need some kind of help. Well, in that case, I guess we have no choice. King Moe's killing. I guess you can learn a lot on a cattle drive, if you live that long. <laughs> the kid from the summer of 42 grows up fast on the great cattle drive of 1866.